first panel, which was uh, fantastic um, in talking about uh, the politics of Brexit. We're going to focus a bit more on uh, the business uh, impact, the business view of um, Brexit and hard Brexit and soft Brexit and uh, everything in between. Uh, we've got a fantastic pat panel. Uh, immediately to my right is Marjorie Chorland. She is the Vice President for European Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, develops policies and executes programs related to trade and investment with Europe. She's also the Executive Director of the U.S. U.K. Business Council and oversees the work of the Business Coalition for Transatlantic Trade. She also served in the U.S. government working for Senator John Danforth in the 1980s and had active involvement in the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement. To her right is Carl Brophy, who is the founder and CEO of Red Flag, a specialist global risk analyst analysis and strategic communications consultancy. He advises and runs multidiscipline campaigns on behalf of some of the world's largest corporations and industry associations. Red Flag has successfully fought and won campaigns on behalf of tier one clients and industries across more than 50 countries. And then finally, Peter Madison uh, is the managing director of international policy at SIFMA. He leads SIFMA's effort, efforts to promote trade investment opportunities for financial services sector. Helping, as well as helping ensure uh, international voices and policy, policy experiences are brought to positively influence U.S. policy making. Prior to joining SIFMA, Peter was financial and economic counselor at the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., seconded from Her Majesty's Treasury in London. He decided to stay with us in the United States, thankfully. And Peter spent 12 years at uh, Her Majesty's Treasury before arriving in the United States, working in a variety of roles. So we very much look forward to uh, hearing our panelists talk about their hopes and fears for the next year and five years from a business perspective, uh, what will what will be facing business? If will goods now have to go through customs procedures? Will there be more friction for services across the board? For financial services in particular, will they be the pound of flesh that the European Commission seems to want to get? Uh, and, and use this to, to dissuade the next Brexit, perhaps check out. I coined that today. Um, so uh, with that, without any further ado, let me, let me turn it over and I think we'll just uh, go right down the road here and, and start with uh, Marjorie. Great, thanks Ted. Thanks very much and thanks to Ken and the whole team at WIDA for inviting me to join you this morning. Um, so I thought from my previous WIDA experience that we would be sitting at a table and I'd be able to read my remarks very surreptitiously. So you'll see me reading some remarks and it won't be so surreptitious. Uh, the other thing I would note at the outset is that I had the good fortune uh, last fall to testify alongside uh, Niall and Tom in front of the uh, House Foreign Affairs Europe subcommittee. And at one point I did actually, I was seated in between them and I did actually sort of sit back and just let the two of them uh, have a conversation. It was actually quite entertaining and I'm glad to see that the, the spirit and the energy is, is still there. Let me uh, start by saying very quickly, what is it companies want uh, from Brexit? Uh, starting from a standpoint that we didn't want it in the first place, but now that we have it, what is it we want? I'll boil this down and then turn to a little bit of detail. Uh, first and foremost, we're looking for clarity on the terms of the transition. Uh, we're looking for, ultimately, as frictionless a relationship as possible. Uh, friction is certainly in the eye of the beholder, but for business that means uh, friction in terms of movement of goods, services, capital, and very importantly, both people and data. Uh, and I would say that the latter is of more importance uh, than ever before across uh, the business community. We're also looking, obviously, for limited regulatory divergence. Uh, there may be, uh, there may be uh, case, cases where that might be different, and we have to sort of bridge the gap between um, the UK cleaving to the regulatory structures within the EU, uh, but also recognize that there are instances where the UK, sorry, the EU and US regulatory structures might diverge, and we, we need to think about which, which way the UK uh, should cleave and how that might work uh, most effectively. Uh, we do at some point want a strong US-UK agreement. The, the, the shape and form of that agreement obviously yet to be determined um, and I do uh, uh, ascribe to the view that you can't really know what you're going to negotiate with the country until you know what their status is. 
So I think that while we know there is a U.S.-U.K. Uh, working group, trade, uh, trade, I don't know if it's called a trade investment working group or just a working group, um, involving USTR um, and the Department for International Trade, uh, and we know that one of the elements on their agenda is in fact beginning to scope out what could be an eventual framework for the negotiations themselves, not, not necessarily an agreement. Um, so we know that there's work afoot and, and they'll get there, but that's certainly not the top of the list of the things that they're working on. Uh, I think the other thing that business wants, uh, which is extraordinarily important, the, the point was made about the UK's departure from the EU and what that will mean in terms of the, not just the policy making process but the philosophy behind the policies that emerge from Europe. And what business thinks we need is for other member states, uh, other like-minded member states to pick up the slack. Uh, we are going to need countries from the Nordics, from the Baltics, um, uh, the, the Netherlands and so on who have a similar uh, philosophy and outlook in terms of what the, what the shape and burden of regulation should be and how you maximize the benefits uh, of the relationship in the single market and the customs union uh, to step up and make sure that the commission, which I, by the way, don't think is dictatorial, um, is a bit arcane uh, and does have a tendency in some instances to, to have a heavy hand from the business community's perspective. <coughs> um, we need to make sure that that voice uh, is heard at the table. I'm just going to, rather than run through all of this, because it's going to be much more interesting, I think, to have the conversation, let me just, because I get to go first and nobody else did this, um, run through a couple of um, facts and figures to help you understand why how this goes is so very important. Um, Brexit obviously matters because of the extent of our, our economic ties. We are, as a reminder, each other's single largest foreign investors, uh, and more than two and a half million jobs uh, in the US and the UK are dependent on this relationship. Two-way trade totaled over $225 billion in 2016. I'd like to thank Dan Hamilton and Joe Quinlan for the latest version of the transatlantic economy um, study because they gave me the latest facts and figures. Um, American companies have invested approximately $680 billion in the UK, which represents about a quarter of US investment in Europe and about 10% of US investment worldwide. Uh, that investment directly employs about 1.4 million uh, Britons. Uh, more than 1.2 million Americans uh, work for UK companies, and it turns out there are jobs in every single state of the country. Uh, attributed to, to, the, to these investments. Uh, Britain has invested more than $550 billion here, which accounts for about 15% of all foreign investment in the United States. In terms of trade, the UK is our fifth largest trading partner and our seventh largest, uh, sorry, fifth largest export destination and seventh largest trading partner overall. Uh, uh, important for the administration to understand that uh, U.S. goods and services exports to the U.K. total about $120 billion, yielding a $15 billion U.S. trade surplus. Um, it's also, I think, worth comparing uh, the, the, just the magnitude and the scope of U.S. investments in the U.K. As of 2016, U.S. companies had invested only 14% as much in China as they have invested in the U.K. So again, to give you uh, some, some sense of the magnitude. I wonder if I should stop there and, I mean, I, shall I go on? I'll go on. Uh, obviously, Peter's going to talk a little bit about <coughs> the financial services, <coughs> excuse me, the financial services uh, piece of the puzzle here, but <coughs> it, I have to say that financial services as a, as a sector is probably more advanced in its thinking and approach to Brexit uh, than just about any other sector that I can think of. Um, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the private sector has gone through various stages of grief uh, in the aftermath of the referendum. There was denial and anger and all that sort of stuff. But what I found increasingly in talking to our members is that for many of them, they've now accepted that this is happening. Um, they think it, it isn't going to turn back. There isn't going to be a last minute sort of smack in the head V8 moment saying, oh my gosh, you know, what were we thinking? Let's, let's, let's go back to how it was. 
Um, so, so for many companies, the question now is, how do we make sure that the impact is minimized on, on our ability to serve our customers? The financial services industry, as I said, has been especially forward-leaning um, in this regard. Uh, obviously, they have the unique circumstance of needing to figure out, with the loss of their passporting rights, how they're going to be able to serve customers not only in the UK, but also on the continent. And they've gone to great lengths uh, to develop mitigation strategies depending on which way the negotiations go. Um, other sectors, I would say, are not quite as far along, and they would do well to take a page, I think, out of the financial services sector's book. Uh, uh, I think that, um, you know, for us, the transition right now is the single most important uh, item on the agenda. Yes, figuring out, sorting out Northern Ireland from a political perspective, top of the list and arguably one of the most difficult um, aspects of this negotiation, if not the most difficult. But for business, the key is what are the terms of the transition going to be? That's important because we believe that the transition should look as close to the status quo as possible and that it should last as long as it needs to until the future relationship is set up so that business and government, for that matter, only have to transition once, right? Because if we have to change for the transition and then change to something else completely different, uh, the costs of that are, are, are going to be um, astronomical. So for us, the transition is critically important. The future, of the, sh the future shape of the relationship is also very important. Um, I think there are a lot of questions yet to be sorted out that are political questions, first and foremost, uh, that we are trying to inform by providing the real world business impacts. But at the end of the day, these are some tough political decisions uh, that both Brussels and London will have to take. Why don't I stop there and turn it over to Carl? Um, I think I'd like to um, restrict my comments a little bit to a point that Lucinda made towards the end of um, her contribution and some of the points made there. And um, one of the biggest problems with Brexit, and you've heard it so far today, is that there is a very, very little knowledge of what's going to happen um, with the relationship between the UK and the EU. But the one thing we do know, and Lucinda made this point, is that the EU itself uh, is going to change in attitude and in form and in the way that it approaches business. And uh, if you're going to ask a question, what is the EU going to look like after Brexit, how it's going to behave, and answer it in, um, in, in one sentence, it's going to be more French. Um, and you know, Depending on your perspective, that might be a good thing. Um, for some people in the business world, that might not necessarily um, be uh, be the best thing we have. It will be more German as well, but Angela Merkel has managed to put together a government um, in the last uh, number of weeks. Uh, she successfully got um, the Grand Coalition through, uh, but Angela Merkel is um, probably um, in decline now. Um, her power is still great, but um, Emmanuel Macron is the driver of the European project in many ways, not, not in all of them. So, and if you listen to some of Macron's um, um, rhetoric in the last um, number of months, like he says that he wants Europe to become an economic, social, environmentally, and scientific power that can face um, the US and China. Um, and so if we're looking at what the EU after Brexit um, um, is going to look like for business and for trade, um, it's really, really important to look at where the distribution of power is going to be and how that power is going to be used. Um, so, for example, the, the, just the very fact of the UK leaving um, will leave um, Germany and France with approximately 25% of, nearly 25% of all the MEPs in the European Parliament almost immediately. And the point has been kind of alluded to in the previous uh, contributions. For the last 12 to 20 years, in many ways, the UK has been a, a significant blocking power um, on some of the more kind of anti-business um, kind of you know, yearnings of um, certain people um, in the EU project. Um, and that's gone. Um, and it's going to go almost immediately overnight. Lucinda said it's already waned. It certainly has. Um, people have been um, focused on Brexit. And how is that going to actually manifest itself? Um, you know, and we've already seen a little bit of kind of saber rattling happening from um, certain French and Germans of Mo Moscovici. Um, the, um, um, the French commissioner said recently that 
the new digital tax kind of proposals that they're talking about represent the views of France and Germany and if other member states have a problem with that you can take it up with France and Germany um, and that is beginning to be a little bit of a theme and um, that's running through and um, the, the kind of where we're kind of looking at the tea leaves and, and how the EU is going to break out in the future and um, if you look at the qualified major majority voting system as kind of EU council level um, on important things after Brexit um, the French and the Germans will control 33.4 or 33.5% of the vote. You only need 35% to have um, a blocking minority, and it also makes it very, very easy to actually move um, any proposals you want through the QFV. Now, there are certain competencies that um, member states hold vetoes over, but it's going to be harder and harder for those countries that you refer to, the ones like minded countries in terms of the, uh, in the US, the more liberal market oriented uh, countries to hold the line um, when Britain isn't there, you know. Um, it's probably a fair criticism of um, some of the EU member states that they didn't, they always felt that Britain would, you know, uh, or the UK would make their case um, in Europe and that they didn't necessarily have to, um, you know, put in as much effort on certain, certain issues. Um, we're already seeing the beginning of countries forming new alliances um, um, around Europe, in, within the Euro, within the, uh, the Euro group um, in particular. That hasn't necessarily gone down very well with the French and Germans. Again, there, um, um, there's, there's been some um, exchange in the last number of weeks about um, the Netherlands, a, a group mainly led by the Netherlands and Ireland on, on the Euro group. So I think if we're looking at the future of Europe and the future of the European Union, where it's going to be you know, it's, it's going to be more restrictive, a little bit more paternalistic um, about business, and more centrally controlled in many respects. Some of that will be good, there will be progressive policies in many respects. In, in, in the area of labour, for example, already the, the manifestation of kind of the EU labour laws will become, there will be more commonality, there will be a drive towards that. And then in particular areas where, um, you know, in the last number of 10 to 15 years, we've had a number of proposals floated by the Commission, and I agree with Lucinda's analysis on um, the Commission, I think they got an unfair rap, but the proposals that are, that are, that will be generated out of um, the Commission, um, which you might have seen before, and they kind of get diluted, and they don't necessarily get implemented um, um, over a number of years, you will see more of those beginning to filter through, um, they won't wither and die in the vine, um, you know, there will be, more, there's a more, Kind of homogenous feeling about certain policies that will c come from com from continental Europe. In, in a couple of just just three examples, finished, but I think it might be useful to have an exchange. And um, the common consolidated corporate tax base is something that uh, you know the French have been pushing. Um, they look look uh, covertly at, uh, for example, my own country's Ireland's uh, corporate tax rate. There will be um, a drive towards more commonality on corporate and corporate and corporation tax. Um, that's something that smaller countries that have had competitive corporation tax policies have rigorously held uh, and fought against. Um, Ireland's ability to maintain its 12.5% corporate tax rate for the large amount of um, US um, FDI into the country when it was bankrupt um, um, was admirable, but it, it will be tested again, I think, um, once um, after Brexit. Agriculture, I think, um, will be um, very, very um, significant. There will be a number of changes. Partly because um, this is uh, this is a political point rather than a trade point. Agriculture is be beginning to become symbolic, um, a totem of um, uh, the U.S. EU relationship. Um, people who have been in Britain um, and talking about Brexit or uh, looking at the commentary on Brexit. Um, if you were to believe most of the commentary on Brexit um, um, and the, the trade deals that the UK is eventually going to have to do with the U.S., um, Britain is going to be awash with chlorinated chickens. Um, and uh, and all sorts of food that doesn't come up to the standards. The, the, the Europeans and the French hold their food standards in very, very high and uh, high esteem, um, and this has become um, a, a totem of the relationship. And I think that will continue um, going forward. To, you know, a, where, and I think also what the French call GAFA, um, um, Google, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple. 
um, will become um, very, very targeted um, in the years to come. They're already seen as uh, uh, the representation and manifestation. So there's almost a, a kind of a triangulation of tension um, on the business side with the European, uh, with, with forces within the European Union, moving in a certain way, reacting deliberately um, um, to this administration's here's policies in some ways, um, and sometimes going against their own actual ideologies and instincts because they want to be seen as more powerful, as a counterbalance, as more progressive. Um, and then Brexit um, will further complicate that. Um, I think we will see, uh, they will begin, the European Union in terms of its approach to business, will begin to position itself into a, a very, very distinct um, uh, and very European um, approach to business that won't have the handbrake of the UK on it in many ways. And we might see um, more alignment between, if they can do a trade deal, more alignment between the UK and the US um, and versus the EU in the future. Um, thank you, and thank you to, uh, uh, to Tim for the introduction and to Ken uh, and to Rita for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here uh, representing SIFMA and uh, the financial services industry. Um, some of, uh, of, of my remarks have already been, been made in different forms, so um, I'll try and be and succinct as possible in terms of uh, relaying them through the, uh, the prism of how the financial services industry um, is viewing uh, the issues that, that Brexit, Brexit is throwing at us. Um, I think just to start, um, you know, it's quite interesting if you, you can read the press commentary and everything that's written about this. You know, you, in 2018 you still, in the British press especially, you still see, you know, this discussion characterised as you know, being between the Leave camp and the Remain camp, um, and you know the referendums happened, and as the first panel I think made clear, the UK is leaving. So at this point in time, in uh, March two thousand eighteen, ultimately we're all leavers. Um, so you know it's it's kind of what do we do with that? That's the world in which we live, and that's the world in which we've been given. And um, I saw this characterised slightly more helpfully a couple of weeks ago in a discussion about the different sides within the British government, within Whitehall, who are, are, are kind of making UK policy on this. And that characterised it between one camp who saw Brexit as a risk to be managed and another camp who ultimately saw it as an opportunity to be seized and exploited. And you know, if I think about this from the financial services perspective, it's really a bit of both. Um, and there's very few situations, I think, where you wouldn't see both an opportunity and a risk. And I think ultimately that's that's how we're kind of approaching this, and, and that's how we're we're coming at it. Um, I think you could probably say that some of the ri the risks are front loaded, and those are the things that are going to confront us and have to be addressed earlier in the process. But it's probably not quite as black and white as that. I think it's um, you know it's it's a complex issue. Um, now, you know, I probably don't really need to, to tell a room of people who've come to a Brexit seminar, you know, about kind of why financial services is important in this context, but I will. Um, you know, if, if any other economy left the European Union, it would be a big deal. You know, if any of the 28 departed, it would be, it would be significant, and I'm sure we'd have lots of discussion about it here in Washington. Um, but the fact that this UK that's leaving, I think, you know, brings the financial services issues and challenges uh, really to the fore. Because obviously, if you ever look at these these studies that uh, you know various groups do of the most important financial centres of the world, London is is most of the time at number one. Sometimes it's number two with New York at number one. I don't really know how they, they kind of measure these things, um, but you know, I think everybody recognises that London is a crucially important, vibrant financial centre. Um, not just for the UK, but also for Europe and its economy. Um, and you know, Marjorie gave some, some very illuminating stats from the kind of macro uh, economy level. You know, just some quite powerful facts and figures from the financial services perspective. Um, you know, some two times the amount of dollars are traded in the United Kingdom are traded here in the United States. Uh, the UK presently accounts for around about forty percent of cross-border foreign exchange transactions. Um, over 50% of cross-border bank lending. Um, you know, I could go on and on, but there's just no shortage of powerful statistics 
that really underlines the, uh, the, the significance and, and, and the importance of the UK um, as a financial centre and, and obviously the global uh, economic weight that that, that carries. Um, just kind of, again, just another way that this, this discussion tends to evolve and how it's characterised, especially in relation to financial services. Um, you know, we've heard a lot over the course of the past year and a half really about kind of the risks to the UK and what the UK may stand to lose as a financial centre. And that question usually comes down to, will a lot of that financial services business move? Will it go to Frankfurt? Will it go to Dublin? Will it go somewhere else? Um, and, you know, it's somewhat kind of couched in a rather zero-sum manner, I think. And, and, you know, the kind of assumption being that um, if a certain uh, dollar value of business leaves the UK exactly the same dollar value of business will therefore crop up and be undertaken in one of these other financial centres. Um, and I really think it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, you know, you've seen a lot of different voices over the past two years kind of point out that if that business does move, and it is an if, that there's the question of, well, it could go to the United States. You know, if it's, if it's Bank's international activities, there's not necessarily an advantage to, to having it in Frankfurt or Europe. You may want to just centralise it somewhere like New York. The Asian economies are obviously on the rise and, and are growing as vibrant financial centres in their own right. Um, I think they have a lot going for them in terms of attracting new business. It's also been said that some of it just may cease to take place. Um, and some of it may not have to go anywhere. So, you know, I think that's a kind of complex and kind of multi-layered issue, and, and I think you know we should kind of think of that in in a different way than it is sometimes characterised. Um, you know, I've already kind of said that you know you should also recognise that from an economic standpoint, the role that the UK plays, the power of the city of London, its vibrancy, um, its role as a financial hub. That clearly benefits the European economy and the EU economy. Um, and there is definitely an economic benefit um, you know, to maximising the integration of London and the city and the UK's financial services industry within the European economy. Now, you could argue that there's obviously a political cost. Um, I think everybody recognises that. And the EU is, is managing that trade-off. Um, but you know, let's not lose sight of that. The EU gets a lot from, uh, from the city and from the UK and from its financial services industry um, and diminished access uh, you know, to what has been called a global public good would not be a positive thing for growth in the EU economy and for its future. Um, and then finally, and 